Kids and Creations with Tracy Bloom, a video cast that features people of all backgrounds who inspire and uplift children with their work. Uh, today, I have the honor and privilege of speaking with Loretta Claiborne, who is here today. We had some technical difficulties, but we are here and we are on Zoom. So thank you, Loretta, for being here. You're welcome. Well, um, I know a lot of people have have heard your story and for those of them who have not heard your story you have overcome and achieved so much in your life um, including I mean you were born with um, was it a disfigurement on your feet I had uh, orthopedic problems with my feet so when I was very small I had to wear a brace and then as I got older I had surgery on my feet yeah, and then you were also born um, with an intellectual disability. Yes. As well, and so... Um, I was born blind, too, and I didn't see it till the age of four. Yeah, and so even, you know, for a child, you know, we look at how, how kids live their lives and how they interact with, with the world around them on a daily basis. And so those things, you know, having your vision impaired, having your your ability to move around impaired, to have, you know, all of these different things coming together as a young child, that was a lot, I'm sure, for you to, to work with and to overcome. Yes, uh, I didn't really notice anything when I was that age. Of course, I don't remember when I was four, but I remember the stories that my mother told, and I wish she would have had pictures of me when I was really small, but she didn't. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's seven siblings, and then we adopted one. And then I guess you just didn't have money for things like that. That was considered as a luxury when you're raising seven children in a housing project. You know, you were worried about having good, clean clothes on their back and food on the table and roof over the head. So uh, I heard the stories that my mother told. And then at the house, you know, inside, which are six other brothers and sisters, you don't realize or you don't know because everyone's treated the same. If there was something for my sister to do, my mom would say, okay, you go out there and clean out the yard. And she would look at me and says, oh, there's no reason why you can't go out and clean the yard either. And she would right. be out in the yard the same as everybody else, cleaning, cleaning the yard or what have you, or mowing or whatever kids did. It didn't really... I never understood anything until I hit the schoolyard. Mm, yeah. Then when I hit school, of course, like every other kid, my mother sent me. I learned how to walk at four. And then at the age of five, well, you, you get ready and prepare to go to kindergarten. And I went to kindergarten. I don't think I was ready or prepared from the way my mom sounds and from the way now I do remember being in kindergarten. I do remember my teacher, and uh, I remember having Mrs. Wolf. I remember having Mrs. Crenshaw. So um, when I was in kindergarten, I repeated, I had to be in the same room twice. And then when I went to first grade, I was in the same room twice. And I went to second grade, I was in the same room twice. And then I was sent to Mrs. Crenshaw's class, which was a regular ed, but right straight from there, I went to a special education class. My mom had me tested and everything. And I guess I should have been in special ed at kindergarten, but then they didn't do that. Your child with a different ability was either placed in, in an institution far away from home. And my mother wasn't gonna have that. Mm -hmm. You know, her children, she thought that she had her children her children was her responsibility. If, if more parents would think of that today, we wouldn't have the problems that we have with our children. Right. And, um, you know, I was just reading a lot about your upbringing, and it seems like the support you received from your mother was just so huge in how your life just unfolded and how you went on to more or less come into who you are and running and 
uh, you learned how to channel some of the anger you had as a child into the sport. Is that is that accurate? Yes, in a sense, but you got to remember where my mother came from. Being, you know, a black woman and her time when she grew up, children like her, not that my mom was very smart, very bright, but children who happened to be black at that time, the schools were separated here. Mm -hmm. So she went to an all black school and they didn't have the resources and tools as the white schools. So she seen, you know, how she was going to be treated. She didn't want her kids to be treated like her. So she knew when she had her kids that it was going to be a new time and a different day. In her eyes, it was going to be a different day. So knowing that she had a child that had challenges and she knew what that, those hurdles that child was going to carry, regardless of the hurdles, she was going to make sure. She knew what it was like to be ostracized or, for say, put out of the realm because of her color of her skin, not because she wasn't bright, not because she didn't. It was just the color of her skin that made her different. When, when she had me, she knew it wasn't only going to be the color of the skin, but she knew that with my learning ability, that I was going to be different. But in her home, I was going to be treated the same. And if she had anything, any right to do with it, that I was going to go to the same school that my sisters and brothers went to, regardless. Even if I had to be educated in the room where we didn't get out and see the other kids and we had our own playground, she was going to make sure that didn't happen. So right there, it started with the mother. Yeah. I like that you said <clears throat> that your mother, you didn't realize that you were any different because your mother didn't treat you any different. I, she didn't treat me any. In fact, she was harder on me. <laughs> I remember. Sounds like a great woman. In the, in the house one day, and my mom said to her, I'm just going to give a fictitious name. Where's Anna? My sister says, hers over to her house. And my mother turned around, looked at my sister, said, oh, no. You don't talk like that. Let this be an understanding. I do not send you to school to talk like that. You have English, you learn, learn English, you learn to talk proper in my house. You understand? Now I'm going to ask you again, where is Anna at? Anna's over so-and-so's house or she is over so-and-so's house or I don't know where. So me looking at my older sister, who was a year older, I wanted to be like her because she was popular. Well, you know, you're the next in line. It's just like your doggie. If there was an older dog, that would be the alpha male. Well, I wanted to be like my sister. And of course, I start following some of the things that she did. And later on, my mom asked me, where's Denise at? Given the fictitious name and I said, hers over her house. My mom smacked me in my face. Oh, yeah. You would say that's child abuse today. But then it wasn't. Not when you're single-handedly raising seven children. There's no man in the house. She had to be the mother. She had to be the teacher until we went to school. And I remember her giving me a whack. And she said, you, you, you saw what I said to your sister a week ago, and now you're going to, no, no, I don't tolerate that. And that's how my mother was. Mm. And she would always say to me, it's going to be much harder for you. It's going to be much harder for you to get through. And I would just like sit there. I didn't understand. What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, when I went to school, I found out it was much harder. Yeah. And with kids today, you know, bullying is a big deal. And oh, my, my grand... It'd be my niece's little boy. So that would be my grand nephew is going through that now. And I talked to my niece and I said to her, what's wrong? And she says, it's, I just don't get it, Loretta. She says, these kids on the bus. I said, well, aren't there an adult? Isn't there an adult on the bus? That's not the bus driver's job. He's to watch the road. I said, I said to my niece, I said, you need to do something about this. So she wants to show him the, uh, pit, the movie of me. And he's only like, I think he's nine. 
And I want to go over so bad to talk to him, but now with this COVID going on, you just can't do that. Right. So when the weather breaks, I'm going to go over, I'm going to bite the bullet. I got both the shots and we're going to sit in the yard, a couple feet apart, Yeah. talk, listen to some music, then I'm going to talk to him. Yeah. I'm going to take the movie over and say to him, you know, kids will do that. And you got to prove them wrong. And you don't have to listen to those kids. And I know it's hard on that school bus, but I also, I, I'm also going to say to my niece, you need to talk to the teachers or whoever and find out what's happening on this bus. Right. And I you think- You know, today with this pandemic, kids that age are taking their lives. Yeah, they are. They are. And it's it's so sad. And I think that- you know, a lot of kids are experiencing hardships, especially with the pandemic. And then on exactly. top of it, there's there's always been kind of this growing problem of bullying. And I think by, like you're saying, sitting down and talking to people and just sharing your feelings and sharing. And I've experienced it. Mm -hmm. I've experienced it. And I said to my niece, I said, you know, I'm sorry. I said, but yes, he is going to start to act out. And I've never known him to act like that. He was always a friendly, quiet, get along kid, could play with anybody, play in the creek, get the frogs, that type of kid, which you don't see in the city much anymore. But they live right outside the city in a suburban area, really nice homes. But I said to my niece, I said, I would love to come over and talk to him. Yeah. But I'm sorry. You can only take so much. And I said, when I was his age, I was very angry. I didn't talk. I just used my fist. I said, and it, I, you know, I had an, a disability. This kid doesn't have anything. Like the kids making fun of his hair. He has his right to wear his hair anyway, his mother or him. He wants to wear his hair. And he's always wore his hair. Like a, not dreadlocks, but he always had wavy hair. And these kids are making fun of it. So I'm going to try to teach him to use some humor. And just say like to these kids, well, you make fun of my hair, but obviously you would like to ha have hair like mine. Yeah, that's it. You know, they say that when a child or anybody makes fun of somebody else, they're seeing a weakness in themselves. Yep. And I think, I mean, I, I watched pieces of the movie about you. And there's parts where I just went, oh, like, um, you know, just showing the schoolyard. And how, how was it for you to have Disney create a movie about your life story? You know, I didn't want to have that movie produced or, or made. But then it was at a time, of course, it was 20 years ago, 21 years ago, when they made the movie. And I remember... Some friends of mine, Dr. Tim Shriver and Nora Mason, they they lived up in Connecticut and I would go back and forth volunteering for the Special Olympics, just getting on the Greyhound bus, riding. Of course, it only takes five hours to get to Connecticut, but get on the Greyhound bus, it's 10 hours. And getting off the bus and staying with Tim and his family or staying with Nora and going in the office and volunteering. And I remember Tim, Tim saying, you know, did you ever think about having a movie made on your life? I said, no, and I'm not interested. And then Mrs. Mason, who I just got off the phone with, said the same thing. I said, I'm not interested. And then one day she said to me, well, Loretta, maybe, you know how it feels, how you got teased and, and things like that? I said, yes, I know very well. I said, um, I'd like to forget it but it's always there. So she said to me, and we sat down one day and I said, okay. And I thought it, thought it over for months. I said, you know, if I could change one child's way of thinking of how they treat another child, it is worth it. No, that's or If I could teach another kid that's thinking different about another kid, it is worth it. One child. So if one child is bullying somebody because they live on the other side of the track or one child's bullying somebody because they have an intellectual disability or the color of the skin 
or the way they act. If I could just change one child, then it's worth it. And then I agreed to have the movie made. That's really- I don't know if I liked the movie. I thought they did well with the fact of it. But one thing, they never said I graduated from high school. And that was my mother's dream is that I graduate from high school, not with a dis different diploma, not with a certificate saying I attended school. She wanted me to have the same diploma as my sisters and brothers. Loretta Claiborne has completed her studies at William Penn Senior High School. And you also have um, learned several different languages, gotten a black belt in karate. I earned my fourth degree black belt and I was maybe and maybe a year's worth, not even a year's worth of training out from receiving my fifth degree black belt. And there was no special provisions. Believe me, I had broken uh, ribs, I had broken toes, I had broken fingers. I went through the whole reg regime the same as everyone else. And then I was a female. So I had these big 200 pound guys kicking me in the ribs hoping that I would quit. Mm. And obviously you're not a quitter because you know, you've know you competed in what over 26 marathons. I ran 26 marathons and I'd done many sports. I had a, taste, a little bit of taste of everything. And the reason why I did sport was my mother, she never had that opportunity because of the color of her skin. And I remember her one night sitting and talking to me and she says, you see all those sports you're doing? Enjoy them. She says, because I never had that opportunity. Thank the good Lord that you had that opportunity. That's an opportunity I didn't have. So I look at sport much differently than a lot of my teammates. I know a lot of my teammates, it's always about the medal, the medal, the medal, mm -hmm. or we lost, or this and that. And I look at them, I, and I would tell my teammates, I remember at national games when my teammates got really upset, start throwing things. And I looked at him, I said, you know what? Does this put any food on your table? And he looked at me. What do you mean? I said, are you getting paid to play soccer? No. I said, okay, does this put any money in your pocket? No. I said, then enjoy the opportunity. I said, and just think, we're here at National Games. Look at all our friends that are sitting home that wish they would be here. So I look at sport totally different. And how did you get into running itself? How did you find My brother it? Hank. My brother Hank was a, a track and cross country runner. And we lived in the projects. And there was a big field behind this project. Well, Hank was in high school and the coach really liked him. So he knew where they stored the track equipment and he actually got permission. And he would go get a, somebody who had a car, bring the hurdles over to the field and him and these guys who went to the same school would be on that field doing the hurdles and I remember them running around the field and I would follow them. Then my mom would look out the window. She says, well, at least I know where Loretta is. <laughs> but then she tried to talk me out. Oh, you need to leave the boys alone and let them do their thing. When well, my brother Hank was a cross country runner and I would follow him. And that's how I got into running. And I was 12, I wasn't quite 13. And then how did you, how did you get into um, competing in the Special Olympics? Well, 1966, like I said, I started running with my brother. Then I went to high school and I was going to a school to work program where you go to school a week and then you work a week. And they were preparing, that's how they prepared special education students then. You would go to school a week if your parents, if you wanted to. And then hopefully when you got out of school, you had a full-time job at the place. So it was a shelter workshop and I would go to school a week and then go to the workshop a week and I would get in a lot of trouble. And then one day the counselor called me and after a bad day, bad morning, he says, can you come in my office? He called over there and come and I went in and he talked to me. He says, I think I have something for you. And I'm thinking, yeah, right. Everybody has something for me and then they want to diss me, that type of thing. But nope, it was a paper 
and it said Special Olympics. And he, I took it home. I thought my mom would just throw it in the garbage like everything else on top of the refrigerator with all the other junk. <laughs> and she didn't. That Saturday, she called me. I was in bed. It was 6 o'clock in the morning. She said, get up. So I talked to that man. Now, you go to that workshop. I said, but it's cold outside. And the training is lightning. And he would say a few choice words. I bet you I got up. Went to the first practice. And I came home. She said, how was it? I said, OK, I quit. Said, what? You don't, you don't quit nothing in my house. So my mom was tough. And I end up here. I am. That was in 1970. They'll part well, can't participate now because of COVID. Yeah. Still here. And you've competed in several of the Special Olympics. So can you, how have you evolved as an athlete and a person from the first time you competed to the last time you competed? Well, the first time I competed, there wasn't much in our area. I couldn't speak for around the country, but it was all U.S. based. And um in my area, there wasn't much but track and field and swimming. I wasn't good at swimming because most black kids didn't go to swimming pools. We used to walk past the Y coming home, getting our hair done. And I said to my sister, one of these days, I'm going to swim in that pool. And she's oh, come on, I'd rather stop. Oh, you always got to stop there and watch them people. You know you can't swim. Colored kids don't swim in that pool. I said, one of these days, I'm going to swim in that pool. When I got in my 30s, I called my sister up. I said, guess where I was? I said, swimming in that pool. <laughs> At YMCA. But getting back to the story, it was through my counselor and I still participate. I do like nine to 10 sports and how I do it. I do all these sports and everybody thinks, well, you do all these sports. How can you compete in them? I pick my sports that I really focus on. Like tennis is one of my sports now that I really focus on. I don't really focus on basketball, but I go to basketball because I have a lot of friends there. I get the physical exercise and I like the game. But I would, if I was going to a state games, I would compete in tennis. Same way with bowling. I would compete in bowling at one time, but then they didn't have tennis. So bowling was my sport. I would train hard in bowling and then do other sports. But now I compete in sports and I Pick and choose, I do all the sports because they're different times of the year and I stay physically fit. I stay in contact with friends and that's the main reason why. And then I pick and choose my competitive sports. So my competitive sports, if I was in competition now, I would be playing tennis and golf. Those would be my summer sports. And then after tennis and golf is over for the summer, I would play soccer. In the fall, that would be my competitive sport. And then I would go into floor hockey, ice skating and skiing in the winter. And then in volleyball, I just started. So volleyball would be my fun sport. And I would train just as hard, but I would use that as my activity and seeing my friends, which is on a Wednesday night. Thursday, you know, I would be skiing. And then Monday, I figure skate. Tuesday, I play floor hockey. So I have all these sports and then I pick and choose during the competition schedule what are my sports that I compete in. It sounds like anything that you have interest in, you've not only done, but excelled at. I mean, is there anything, I've, I'm sure that you've had people say- I didn't excel at swimming. <laughs> oh, I learned how to swim when I was younger. They used to call me the turtle. <laughs> but I liked it and it was a good sport but every our swimming's in the middle of the winter and I would end up with big sinus infections and twice I went to the doctors and it was a $300 doctor bill out of my pocket yeah so, yeah when you were when you were growing up did you have people say you can't do that or even all the time say, do you have people all the time I had actually, when I started martial arts, I did karate for 28 years. My sensei actually looked at me and says, oh, this ain't a place for you. <laughs> but I, and he would say things, he would get in the class and it was me and two other women. And two of the 
other two women were school teachers. One was like a counselor and one was a school teacher and I, and he said right in front of us girls, he says, a woman's place is at home is to take care of the house. <laughs> so the other two girls quit. Oh. And so a friend of mine who was a, going on to be a black belt, Bobby Simpson, who lived in the city, I said, Bobby, I think I'm going to quit. I ain't going to put up with that. He says, Loretta, I want you to hang tough. And he stuck by me. He says, I want you to stick with this. I don't say you don't like girls, but you stick with it because you, you're good at it. You're good at it. Don't let them cheat you out. And he said, if I ever needed anything, he would make sure I got home from karate school if it was dark or we were in the school longer. And I stuck with it. And I stuck with it for 28 years, started in 1971, and I stuck 1999. Then I joined some other martial arts classes and they kind of fell apart. I really miss it, but it's just one of those things that right now it's not safe. And one of the reasons why I quit competing in martial arts because it was a big time during the AIDS epidemic and so I stopped competing. Between the, all the sports that you've done, do you find a commonality of like mental peace through just kind of getting in the zone of whether it's running? I do that with running. Yeah. With running. I know um, we had some big meetings coming up. I ser serve on the board of directors of Special Olympics and I serve on other committees. And I'm the athlete rep, so a lot of these, a lot of the athletes think, oh, I want to be on the board, I want to be on the board, but they don't realize that when you're on the board that serves the whole globe, it requires a lot. Like I had a staff meeting this morning before you. Yesterday I had meetings. At eight o'clock, what's today? Thursday, today's Thursday. <laughs> I had meetings yesterday after I got out of my silver sneakers class and I do spin cycle at the Y and silver sneakers. I had meetings yesterday. I had meetings on Tuesday. And I said, uh, if you want to be on the board of directors for SOI, you're going to have to give up a lot. You're going to have to sacrifice a lot. It's just not just sitting there in your suit. <laughs> it's work. <laughs> I'm in my workout clothes now, but it's not sitting there in your suit. Yeah. You had to take part. And we had a really tough meeting. And I knew a lot of the people that were going to be on this committee aren't athletes. Mm -hmm. And I was figuring out how could I deal with this? And I went running and I figured it out. Yeah. It's funny how when we, when we get into these, these spaces of, you know, relaxation and it's hard to say that you're relaxing when you're jogging but we're running um but it is it is that way you know you get in this mm -hmm. peace this this flow and that's I think that's why you know when I write books I, I get in the zone you know like I'll sit down and just write and it's almost like everything just kind of fades away and then right. the answers come right yeah so I've seen that you've done some TED Talks and you've also yes. um, done a lot of speaking events for kids. What are some of the key messages that you share when you talk to kids? I always tell children, because you know, I go to a lot of schools. I was just in the Middle East uh, right before the pandemic hit. And actually I was supposed to go back last April and do a whole s stream of schools. But I always tell kids, Find something you like when you're down. Because so many times kids get upset, like my grandnephew. I'm pretty sure he's pretty upset right now. I don't know if he's in school because uh, they had the coronavirus and one of the high schools and they had to shut all the schools down again today, this week. It just keeps going on and on and on. I always tell him, find something that you like. And do that thing that you like, if it's like watching a movie or, or playing on the computer. And then take time and take that thing that you like and think about the bad things and think about what you, how you can turn those bad things into better things. And I always tell kids, 
you are unique. No matter what you look like, no matter where you come from, that you are unique and always be your best. And so many times kids let people down now. You know, it could be another kid or it could be a teacher. Never let nobody down you. And if you have a problem, find somebody you can find comfort in to tell them. And I know a lot of kids like right now with the COVID situation, they're stuck home probably in, not in the best place. Like school is their refuge. And I feel for them. And it's probably really tough for them because right now with the situation, abuse is really high with children. Mm -hmm. Parents are stuck at home. They're working at home. They got to deal with children. And I say a good mom is one who would stick up for their child and get, make sacrifices so their kid can make a gain. But that seems like it's not reality, but it is. But for a lot of people, it's not. Yeah. When I talk to a kid, I always tell a kid, you are unique. Never let nobody down you. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard, but you will make it. Be your best. Don't You don't have to be so-and-so's best because so-and-so is the best at math. Or you don't have to be like so-and-so because they have this or they have that. Just be yourself and be your best. My mom used to always tell us going out the door. <laughs> I, used to, I used to mock her. And one day I was going to school. She says, where are you going? I said, Vita, I'm going to be late. I'm going to be late for school. She says, oh, you are. She says, well, you, you ain't walking out my house looking like that. And I looked at her and I turned around. She said, you go up in that mirror and look at your hair and get that brush and comb your hair back. And so I went up, ran upstairs, got the brush, combed my hair back, fixed my ponytail, went down. She says, now, you look, that's how you walk out my door. Because when you walk out my door, I want you to look your best. So then you'll feel your best. And when you get to school, you can be your best. Aww. So I don't care what nobody got to say. When you walk out my door, I want you to look your best. And you wasn't looking, honey child, you were not looking your best. That <laughs> hair was everywhere. Don't tell me. I said, because two or three brushes are sitting up in there. I got five girls. Don't tell me you couldn't grab one of those brushes and pull your hair back. You feel your best. When you get to school, be your best. That's how my mother was. She, Simple. She sounds like a great mom. Yeah. Um, so I guess before we wrap it up here, is there any, any final words of advice that you have for kids who are going through hard times at home um, or who are experiencing difficulties and trying to find ways to, um, you know, get through everything and find peace? You know, there used to be a little cliche thing and it was a picture of a cat hanging on a pole. And I think you remember this, hang in there. Hang in there. <laughs> and that's what they have to do is try to hang in there. Try to find somebody they have faith in or joy in or something they have faith and joy in. If they know mom's downstairs arguing or it's a tough time and they have a little space, they might won't have their own bedroom. I shared a room with five girls. But I had, I would make my own little space or go out in the porch because we couldn't need the porch. I'd take my jacks and play my jacks. Find your space and hang in there. I love it. One day, the sun is going to shine better. I hope. Yeah. And now I want to go get that poster of the cat. <laughs> Yes, it was a, I remember that cat. It was a striped cat and he would be hanging in there. <laughs> well, because right now we all have to hang in there to get through this thing, this pandemic. It's actually in my last call before we had our call, I said to somebody, if you have some, this pandemic's affecting everyone. And I said, if you think it's not affecting you, you're wrong. Some way, shape, or form, it's affecting everyone. Yeah. 
not go visit your mom. You cannot shake her hands. I said, now that the vaccine is out, there's a little relief. I said, but even if you're a kid that's three years old, just start talking. Mommy takes you to the park. The swings are at the park. You see other little kids and you want to play with those little kids. That's what a three-year-old knows. And mommy says day after day, honey, we can't go to the park today. And the little kid's saying to mommy, why? I want to go to the park. And then she starts to cry. Mommy doesn't know how to say to her, we can't go to the park because you will get sick. Right. So is that affecting that child? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. All she wants to do, all she knows is going to the park with mommy. Mommy's walking the doggy or pushing her. And she sees other little kids and they're playing in the sandbox. Yeah. Do that. Yeah. This whole last year has been really, um, I, I've just found a lot of unique things about even myself that I didn't even realize were there, you know? And so, mm -hmm. you know, in troubling times, I'm like, okay, I guess I've just been creating little ways to find joy. So every day I did a dance party with my dogs in the kitchen and called it dog dance party and mm -hmm. <laughs> learned how to bake bread. And I looked up theater scripts and learned how to write a play. And, you know, just all these things where I'm I like, picked up my harmonica. I found my harmonica. I got it several years ago. And I just sat there on the couch and piped at the harmonica as long as the neighbor couldn't hear it. She's at work. Um, I with my knitting, I, I knit these hats and I sell them. And with the money I make from the hats, I give to Rising Stars. Well, I got $300. I can't give to Rising Stars because there's no children's programs oh. open. Oh. Only schools. Schools are open here and um, preschools. And you can't go to them unless you're a parent to stand outside. Oh, it's, it's really tight here. Our cases are going up. Yeah. I have this $300 that I've been wanting to give to Rising Stars and I can't do that because nobody's allowed in the Crispus Attic Center but the charter school in the daytime and the school across the street for littler kids. Hmm. And most of the kids here are, you don't see kids outside playing like you used to. I go up to the park, I'm like three blocks, three and a half blocks from the park, I go up and hit tennis balls. The other day, school was out. You see maybe one or two kids up there swings with their parents, a couple boys on the basketball court. You don't see the kids like you used to. Yeah. And I, I live near a corner store. It's a half mile from here. You go to the store and at two o'clock, that store would be loaded with kids. They even had signs up, two students at a time. You don't see nothing like that anymore. I said to the lady, I said, Ashley, where's the kids at? She says, Loretta, I don't know. Yeah. And it's like you're saying, it's definitely impacting people, even if they're not aware. I mean, when I was a kid, it was you get up in the morning, you ride your bike, you go play in the creek, you play yep. night games at night, go play in the treehouse. I mean, I was just like this outdoor kid. And then you'd come right. home at night and check the messages on the answering machine and eat dinner, you know, and then but now it's like, even those little things where everybody's separated, it's going to impact kids' um, communication skills and how they interact with people. The whole thing, it'll, it, it's little things, but they're big when they... Yeah. Yeah. You don't see kids up at the park. And I said to some, I said to Miss Hollis, I said, you know what? It's, it's really sad. I said, you used to go to that park and it would be loaded loaded with kids on them swings i said loaded them guys be down that basketball court they get so loud that i pick up my tennis balls and leave and there was always somebody on the other three courts and then the one court has a net down there's always somebody with their dog or a little baby on them one of the little tri bikes none of that i said you see people walking but yeah no you don't see those kids out like that yeah that's just i said that hurts yeah You'll see families, you know, you'll see a family walking by, but nope. No picnics at the park. Yeah. Like you can rent the benches and stuff. 
None of that. Yeah. So when things kind of resume normalcy, do you have any any big plans for this year? I'm not going to, I was supposed to take a cruise with my Special Olympic friends in September, but that's canceled. Uh, I'm supposed to go to Alaska. I, I don't see myself getting on a plane, even though I got both of the shots and I have a shield and I have a mask. I don't see myself from here to get there. It's, what, a couple hours from the year? I had to go to, out of Harrisburg or somewhere. Mm -hmm to Minneapolis and wait around for three or four hours to get the plane for another five hours to go to Alaska. I just don't see it. It's a lot of travel time. A lot yeah. of people. A lot of people. Yeah, and then um, people are not being too good about getting these shots now. And yeah. cases are going up. Even though they're giving millions of these shots, the cases are going up here. Yeah. Not looking one. Good. I've had my one. You had shot? Just the one. Um, I get the second one in two weeks, so. Yeah. And then you had to wait 10 days after that. I had the Pfizer. That's the one I had, too. Yeah. I feel bad for the people who had the Johnson & Johnson. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's a lot of people in my community and say, saying to me, he says, I can't, I can't believe you let somebody put that in your arm. That was too fast, too quick, too soon. And I said, well, you know what? I saw four of my cousins die. My school teacher die. Yeah. I said, uh, I see too many people and they all had COVID. Yeah. Yeah. I said, so I'm going to bite the bullet and take my chance. Right. Right. And, and still wear my mask. And you think about the mass processing of grief that we've all had to do over the last year. Just thinking about, I mean, I was recalling the amount of friends and people I know that died last year. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, this is a lot of people for me to grieve in a short period of time. And then, you know, then there's loss of friendships and loss of seeing people that you normally see. And it, it really is a lot for adults to mm -hmm. take on and it's a lot for children too i mean it's this is a very it's hard for children yeah very trying time have you ever written a book for children about grief or sadness during um, the, that might be a good book that would be a good idea um you know i've written books on anti-bullying i've written books on uh olympic athletes <laughs> right yeah, and I've written books on, you know, building things by hand and finding happiness, but I feel like um, grief, I've never really dabbled in. I've never looked at creating a book right. like that, but maybe I should. And, and this is a different kind of grief because even when the person dies, I mean, Miss Dorothy just died in our community. And then yesterday I go to the store and they said, Mr. Moy died. I said, I just saw Mr. Moy. I said, I see him every day. I run down Penn Street and he's sitting on his porch. We call him Garden Man. He died. Two people within this week. And oh, well, you didn't know this. Mr. Banks died, my sister called. And then Lisa's friend, who had a daughter 21 and pregnant, died. All within six days. Wow. You know, and these are people in the community that I know. Now, I didn't know the young lady that died, but I probably knew the mother. Yeah. Wow. My sister said, oh, Loretta, they lived right down in this house in the when we lived on the West End. So it just goes to show. It's, and you can't go to the services. Right. Right. That's I mean, I would have really went too. to Mrs. Reaver's service. I mean, she was my teacher that was really good to me. She was my special education teacher. She was the one that, you know, I talk about in the movie and no nope. hmm. it's just sad yeah well maybe i should write a book on emotions and grieving and yes loss. yeah good idea yeah yeah feelings are you you know how do you feel right you know especially at this time yeah. yeah if you do a little kid's book for a parent to read to them I don't know, but they the kids can get something out of it. 
Yeah. Well, Loretta, it has been a pleasure having you here today. And it's an honor to be here. I'm glad we. Sorry for uh, whatever that other thing was. It didn't work. <laughs> That's so weird. It's like, I see you, I don't see me. Okay, well. well I kept seeing myself. I said, hey, I saw myself for two or three hours this morning on meetings. <laughs> don't need to see myself all the time. Yeah. Uh, I'm, vain. I'm not vain. <laughs> <laughs> Just sit there and stare. Yeah. <laughs> so. well thank you so much you're an inspiration and a joy and it's been so nice talking to you and um thank you again for joining us and um and thank you best of luck in everything you do okay take care you too have good luck with your book thank you